praise you, Jesus. Eye has not seen nor ear heard what God has prepared for them who love him. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to people's hearts as we've stood here and worshiped you. We thank you for being here with us in this place, for walking with us and talking with us, for showing us things, Father. that the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of Jesus Christ and that Lord you've spoken by your word by your son by your spirit Lord we bless you we worship you we bow the knee we commit all to you we thank you for being here as we worship you. For standing here in the midst of us, Jesus. We honor your presence. And Holy Spirit, we give you free reign to do as you choose. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's freedom in the Holy Ghost. There's joy in the Holy Ghost. And Lord, we give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise for all these things. These things we speak in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Father, we do love you. We thank you. We thank you for the word of God, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you, Father, for Jesus who died for us. We thank you, Lord, that you have brought us ever near by the blood of your Son. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for taking the love of God and shedding it abroad in our hearts that we may know the love of Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, the fellowship of the Spirit. Lord, as we open your word, we open our hearts. We open our hearts to your word, Father, and Father, open your word to us today. Give us this day the revelation that we need, our daily bread so that we might walk out of this place changed men and women of God for your glory and for your honor. And Lord, I turn myself to you and turn myself over to the Holy Spirit to speak distinctly and clearly the things that you want to say to your church. And Lord, we thank you. Jesus, thank you for standing here in the midst of us. And we worship you. We give you all glory, all honor, and all praise. These things we speak before the very throne of Almighty God, before the throne of grace. These things we speak in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, let's turn over here this morning to Isaiah chapter 40. We're going to talk about waiting on God. And there's a very familiar passage of scripture here in Isaiah chapter 40. One of the things that we have to realize with Isaiah, Isaiah is, type, is a type of many Bible. There are 66 books in the Bible. There are 66 chapters in Isaiah. The first 40, or excuse me, first 39 chapters in Isaiah deal with the wrath of God. 
on Israel. The next chapters, verses 40 through 66, deal with God loving and showing mercy to Israel. So that's kind of the breakup of the book of Isaiah. So as we start going through the book of Isaiah, we remember that it is prophecy. And the way that we look at prophecy is this. Prophecy has a two mountain effect, if you would. Sometimes as we look out, if you've seen a mountain, you would see the peak of this mountain, but it would overshadow and you wouldn't see the mountain behind it. That's called the two, two way or the two mountain system of prophecy. Let me give you an example. Jesus prophesied and he said, tear this building or tear this temple down and in three days I'll rebuild it. What was he talking about? Well, he was talking about the temple of his body. And in three days, he did raise it up again. What happened in 70 AD? Remember, they were talking to the disciples like, hey, look at this temple. Look at the jewels. Look at the gold. Look at all of this. What did Jesus say? He said, there will not be one stone left upon another. Well, who is the cornerstone? Who is the rock of our salvation? Jesus Christ Three days later, he was crucified, right? But he was alive, raised from the dead, and reigns forevermore. 70 AD, there was not one stone left upon another of the temple of Jerusalem, and it's never been since. Isn't that what Jesus said? So there was a short term, and also there's a long term to prophecy. And the way that they always judged a prophet is if it would come to pass. If the prophecy came to pass, then you were a prophet of God. If it didn't, they'd take you out and stone you. Pretty cut and dry. That's how they did it. That's how we should do it today. <laughs> There'd be a lot less people calling them. We'll lose some people over the Facebook, but there'll be a lot of less people calling themselves, I am such and such prophet of God. Really? Really? Well, okay. Prophesy. We'll judge it if it comes to pass. Then you're a prophet of God. If it doesn't, then we're going to take you out and stone you. There. That deals, you know, that's a pretty harsh way, but you know, there was no false prophecies that came out then, was there? We're saying, or, you know, well, oops, I missed it. Always reminds me of the guy that wrote the book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988. Yeah. Then he said, oh, he missed it, so 89 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 89. And he made a merchandise of the children and the people of God, and he sold a lot of books. Actually, those books are collector's items now. But you, you see, we judge prophecy. We look at prophecy. It must line up with what the Word of God says. Pastor Kevin at Corinth Church, he taught a series. I think he's finishing it up on judging prophecy and looking at prophecy today. So I listened to him, and it was a good study. So if you get a chance, Pastor Kevin at Corinth Church. So anyway, so let's go here to Isaiah chapter 40. Remember, this is the break now. Isaiah 40 begins when he starts talking kindly to Israel. Now, one of the things we have to understand about the book of Isaiah, it was written before Babylon took over and before Jerusalem fell to Babylonian captivity. So all from Isaiah 1 all the way to 39 is a prophecy about how Israel and Judah were going to fall before it even happened. And then in Isaiah 40, he is prophesying and giving peace to these people that will be in exile for 70 years before it even happened. So can you imagine he's giving all this prophecy about Judah is going to fall, the temple is going to be destroyed, and you guys are going to be led away captive for 70 years before it even happened. 
Jeremiah was a contemporary of Isaiah. He was saying the same thing. They didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to hear the doom and gloom. Oh, don't say that. Don't tell us about how bad it's getting and how much worse it's going to get. We don't want to hear that. We want to hear something that's, you know, kind of upbeat. Something a little bit, you know, uplifting. That was not Jeremiah's message. But in Isaiah's message, after he pronounced a lot of prophecy of the doom and gloom, as you could see, that was going to come upon Judah and Israel, he gives them a glimpse of hope here in Isaiah 40. Now, everybody has this passage of Scripture underlined in their Bible, and I'm going to read it, and then we're going to look at something, and this will absolutely change the way that you look at waiting on the Lord. This will absolutely change your life. It will change your prayer life. This is one of those messages that will absolutely change the way that you look at things. And it's just a very, very minute tweak. You know, as the astronauts in the Apollo mission were going toward the moon, you know, they, you would think that during that time, you know, they had a lot of technology they took, you know, and they're going to land on this certain spot on the moon. And it was just, you know, so precise. When they talked with the astronauts, they said, when we went to the moon, there were times that we were 90 degrees off. We had to bring the whole rocket back in and just point it at the moon. So they went to the moon like this, instead of, you know, you would think, well, they had the technology that they pinpointed, you know, something so specific. They said that the landing, the landing field where they were going to land on the moon was hundreds of miles. It wasn't just this little bitty spot. It was hundreds of miles. But you know what? They made it. They landed on the moon. It was a successful mission. Well, sometimes in our Christian walk, we make slight course adjustments. Just a little adjustment here and a little adjustment here to keep us on the straight and narrow. Because you know that Satan either wants to pull us off to the right or he wants to shove us off to the left. We need to be in balance. We need to walk the narrow, the narrow way. So, let's read this passage of Scripture. Everybody has this underlined in their Bible, but we're going to look at it a little different. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. This is the passage everybody has underlined in their Bible, right? But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Everybody has that passage of Scripture in the Bible. All right. Now, those that wait upon the Lord. Now, I heard a pastor, and he gave this example, and it was really good. It changed everything. It changed the way that I looked at this passage of Scripture. He was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. They found spots in his lungs, and then they found some spots in his brain. So they did some biopsies, and they did some tests, and they said, okay, you go home, and we'll give you a call. That's, I mean, they had tests they had to do. They had to do, do all these tests. So, this scripture came up, and he was meditating on it. He says, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall, not, they shall walk and not faint. So, that scripture kept on coming up in his heart. So, as they sat and waited on the test results... He was praying about it. He was believing God for it. And he was standing in faith. And then the Lord spoke to him. 
And let's read this scripture and we'll straighten out some thinking here. Because this is the way that a lot of people, they read the scripture, but this is what they are doing in their hearts. And we need to straighten this out so that way we're on the right path. So I'm going to read it this way. They that wait upon the answer to prayer shall renew their strength. Those that wait upon God's answer shall renew their strength. They that wait on the phone call from the doctor shall renew their strength. Do you see where we're going with this? Those that wait on the response, those that wait on the answer shall renew their strength instead of what does the word say instead of sitting by the phone waiting on a response waiting on an answer to prayer this pastor said i finally got a revelation and started waiting on god the word wait here means to be intertwined to be twisted together to be one so the answer here those that wait upon not the answer that they're going to get from the lord but those that wait upon the lord can you see it can you see it instead of waiting on a phone call sitting by the phone and this is the way that the lord showed me there was a person that had these symptoms that had this and they sat beside the phone they just sat there for three weeks they sat there by the phone believing god waiting on the answer but then the lord showed me the other side he showed me this scripture he showed me a person that was walking with the lord sitting by the phone those that are with or one with or those that wait upon like a waiter waits tables that serve the lord that are spending time with the lord they are the ones that will renew their strength does that make sense have you seen where sometimes we've missed it that oh i'm waiting on the lord i'm waiting on his response instead of spending time with him wouldn't it be wonderful if we're waiting here we are we're waiting for the blessed hope we're waiting for jesus to come back but guess who we're waiting with the holy spirit he's in line with us it's kind of like waiting on a bus you know we're waiting for us to take us to this great place we're waiting to be raptured out of here you know and to be standing there by yourself just waiting on the bus or to be standing in line for the blessed hope to be standing here with the holy spirit with his presence because where the presence of the lord is there is liberty and those those that wait upon the lord they will renew their strength because they are serving and spending time with the lord instead of his hand what he can do in an answer you see how that works we don't seek his hand we seek his face so those that wait upon the lord shall renew their strength we can tie this in with the scripture that says hope deferred makes the heart sick so imagine waiting on a phone call for three weeks if your hope is in that phone call then your heart's going to be sick you're like man another day i wonder if they're going to call today we've been waiting for weeks we've been waiting for months we've been waiting on these test results we're waiting on man instead of waiting on the lord wow that's a big change isn't it it's just a minute little adjustment but it's huge instead of waiting on a phone call 
waiting on test results, those that wait on test results shall renew their strength. It doesn't say that. Those that wait on a phone call from the doctor shall renew their strength. No, it doesn't say that. Those that wait for a prayer to be answered the way that they think it should be answered shall renew their strength. It doesn't say that. It says, they that wait upon the Lord. So simple. So simple, but so profound. This will explain why people are disappointed in their prayer life. God, I thought you was going to answer it this way. I was waiting upon you. I was waiting upon this answer. I had it set in my heart that this is the way that you were going to do it. And guess what? It didn't happen. Well, the Lord didn't answer my prayers. Hmm. Oh, but he did. But not the way that you had limited God. And who were you waiting on? What was you waiting on? An answer to prayer? Or was you waiting on the one who answers the prayer? Big difference. Big, huge difference. See how this straightens out things? Does this answer some question? I prayed, I prayed and I believed God and I waited on God for the answer. <laughs> I waited on the answer, not on the one who answers. Wow. That's profound, isn't it? That is absolutely profound. And this clears up a lot of questions. This clears and this answers a lot of things. Yes, those that wait upon the Lord wait upon Him. I spend time with Him. I almost forget the problem. You spend so much, you just get so caught up with His presence and the joy of the Lord, there is strength. They just get caught up with Him. Just like Enoch. Enoch walked with God. And he was not, because God just took him. He just got so raptured up being with God that what happened to the problems? They became minute. They became nothing. What did Jesus say? Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. But where does the power come from? To come from you? comes through you, but not from you. But as we enjoy the presence of the Lord, the mountains melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. See how we get caught up sometimes. It's just that slight adjustment. Just that slight adjustment, and then it just clears everything up. Does this make sense? Boy, this blessed me. When I seen this, this just blessed me. Because I was, number one, I was going to get to share it with you. And number two, it answers a lot of questions. Lord, I knew that these people were standing in faith. Lord, I knew these people were praying. I knew these people. I knew these people. They were believing God. They were standing. They were doing all these things. Yes, they were. They were doing all these things. But what was they seeking? Was they seeking the answer or were they seeking me? Oh, oh, boy, that answers some questions, doesn't it? Wow, that's profound. Who are we going to spend eternity with? Jesus Christ, God Almighty, the Holy Spirit. And we enjoy his presence now, now, not by what and not for what he can do for us. See, that's where things get kind of screwed up, isn't it? We love him because he first loved us. This is what's going to tie in with what we talked about Wednesday night. The love of God shed abroad in our hearts. The love of what? What he can do for us? No, the love of his presence. 
the love of just being with him, the love of just walking and talking with Jesus and talking with the Holy Spirit and being one with him. Doesn't matter if we get the phone call or not. Could care less. I'm with my Lord. I'm walking and talking with him. I'm so overjoyed that he talks with me and gives me revelation knowledge. I could care less. I could care less about the, the phone call. I could care less about any of that. I'm so overjoyed in his presence. Amen? And that's what we see in the Psalms. When you look at David in the Psalms, what was going on in David's life? David was the rightful king of Israel. He'd been anointed by Samuel the prophet to be king. And he was drove off the throne by a fraction in his family. Saul wanted to kill him, and he was fleeing from Saul. And then after he did get the throne for a while, then what happened? His son, his own son, rebelled against him and tried to split the kingdom up. So most of the Psalms, you could see that it was cries of David's heart for help from the Lord. But if you look at the Psalms, and you look, why was, God, why was David a man after God's own heart? Because he, number one, he was quick to repent. That's number one. He was quick to repent. When, when the Holy Spirit, Nathan the prophet, showed him the error of his way, he was quick to repent very quick. He said, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you, Father. Psalm 51, right? Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. We've talked about that a little bit too. That's Old Testament. Doesn't happen now in the New Testament. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. The Holy Spirit has been given to us to be our comfort, to be our guide, to be our friend, to be the one who leads us out of sin, not condemn us for sin, but to lead us out. By what? By the love of God which has been shed abroad in our hearts. It's the love of Jesus Christ which constrains me from not doing the things of the world world. See how that works. So if God would take away his Holy Spirit, he'd break his word. And we know that can't happen. And the Holy Spirit's been given to us. He dwells in us. He walks in us. So that way we can display Jesus Christ to a dying and fallen world. All right, so let's turn here to Isaiah 41. Since we're right here in Isaiah, Isaiah 41, this is going to answer a lot of questions. Richard had a question the other day. We'll settle it right here too. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 says, Fear thou not. Now the same Isaiah that wrote chapter 41 is the same Isaiah that wrote chapter 40. And Isaiah 40 comes before Isaiah 41 in my Bible. It does. Okay? So, Isaiah chapter 40 was talking about those that wait, those that seek the face of God, those that, that serve and are bound and twisted. That's the Hebrew word wait there. It's twisted together. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So we go here, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 1, or excuse me, verse 10 says, For thou fear not. Fear thou not. I'm with thee. Not the answer to the prayer, not the phone call. I, I am with thee. Be not dismayed. Now this word needs to be spoken in this time, in this hour that we live in. You know, there is a lot of fear that is out there right now. It is driving the economy into the ground. The coronavirus. Everybody's all oh, so fearful of the coronavirus. That it's been hyped up by the media. The numbers are not true. The numbers may be true. Well, we don't know. Well, we think it is a lie. And there's a lot of fear that drives people. 
Fear drives. Love leads. Amen? Fear drives people to do things. Love leads people to do things. We'll let them hang there. Fear thou not. Why? Because I'm with you. For thou, I am with thee. Be not dismayed. You know, it seems like people are running around. They don't know up from down. They're just running around stupid crazy. Or like we used to say, like a chicken with his head chopped off. They're just running around. Why? Be not dismayed. Why? For I am thy God. The God that created everything. I will strengthen thee. Strengthen thee how? By my presence. I'll strengthen thee by my presence. I will help you, yea, I will uphold thee with, and this is for Richard, the right hand of my righteousness, the right standing that you have with me, I will withhold you. It always talks about God when he deals with us always talks about the right hand, the right hand of righteousness, the right hand of fellowship, the right hand always shows love and mercy, the left hand always shows wrath. That's why when God speaks to, I'll uphold you with my right hand. Behold, all they that are incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded, and they shall be as nothing. They shall be as nothing. Think about some of the past battles that you've had with the Lord, you know, that the Lord has taken care of you. Think about some of those battles. Where's your enemy now? Where is that that troubled you? Where is that that persecuted? Where is that now? It's as nothing. It doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. He said, I'll make it as nothing. Man, during the time, it was a mountain, wasn't it? At that time, it seemed like, boy, it just feels like the Lord's pulling me through a keyhole. What is it now? It's as nothing. Why? Because you're here with me. You're here with me. Behold, all they to, that, are, that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing. Now remember, this is Isaiah speaking about the enemies of Israel. This is speaking comfort to Israel after they are in Babylonian captivity. And did that take place? It sure did. Because Cyrus the king gave them the decree to go back and rebuild the temple and to rebuild the walls of the city. He helped them. Not physically, but gave the decree and the support after Babylonian captivity, after 70 years. All right. And this is the Lord speaking. He says, this is what's going to come to happen. He says, verse 12, thou shalt seek them and shall not find them, even them that contended with thee. They that warred against thee shall be nothing, and as it a thing of naught. Did this come to pass? Absolutely. Where's the kingdom of Persia at? It doesn't exist. Where's the kingdom of Babylon that took them into Babylonian captivity? Where is it? It doesn't exist. It's amazing that the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, have been so, so desolated. They've been scattered abroad. The population during the Holocaust, they've been wiped out. They've been driven off their land. All of that has happened to the nation of Israel. And now they're back in the land. It didn't wipe them out, did it? 
No, it didn't. There is no other group of people in all of human history that that has happened to. What about the Incas? Have you met anybody that's an Incan? Been serious, have you? No. That civilization was wiped out. What about the Aztecs? Anybody met any Aztecs? No. That civilization was wiped completely out. How about any Philistines? Anybody met any of the Philistines? No. They're all wiped out too. Who was it that oppressed Israel? The Philistines, the Amorites, the Amalekites. I mean, you can just go down through the list. Has anybody met any of the Amorites lately? No. They don't exist. Not anymore. But God has preserved his people, Israel. He has. He's preserved the land, has he not? Has anybody been watching what's going on in the news right now? In the news that Benjamin Netanyahu is getting ready to send troops over into the Gaza Strip, which gives Israel full control of the Temple Mount? That's why Jordan's upset. Wow, wow. Yeah, because Jordan controls the Temple Mound. That was, a, that was an agreement that's been set up for years. But if Israel goes into western Jerusalem, then that means that they take the Gaza Strip and they take all of that and they get to control the Temple Mound. Then if they want to, they can rebuild the Temple. Wow, that's interesting, isn't it? They said they put that off. Benjamin Netanyahu has put that off until the end of the month. Interesting times we live in, isn't it? Hmm. Again in verse 13 it says, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy what? Thy right hand. I'll hold your right hand. Saying unto thee, Fear not, I'll help you. And if God be for us, who can stand against us? It's going to go God's way, and that's the way that it is. Remember when we talked about that, submit yourself unto the Lord. Humble yourself unto the mighty hand of God. He'll exalt you in due time. Why? Because we're submitted to him. Can anybody overthrow God? No. No. So if we're submitted to him, who can overthrow you? No one. No one. No one at all. All right. Since we're back here, Isaiah chapter, uh, let's go back here, excuse me, Psalm 20, or Psalm 62. Since we're back here in the Psalms. Psalm 62, and we'll just pick up here in verse 1. Psalm 62, verse 1, Truly my soul waiteth upon God. Not the answer, not what God can do for us, not the situation. No, my soul waiteth upon God. From him comes my salvation. It's from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Amen. Amen. How long will you imagine mischief against a man? You shall be slain, all of you. As a bowing wall shall you be and as a tottering fence, they only consult to cast him down from his excellency, and they delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. You know, this week I seen, and it was just absolute heresy, there was a news broadcaster that got on TV and said, well, you know, Jesus Christ was not perfect. That sucked all the air out of my lungs. I said, what heresy is that? 
It's on CNN, I think. I don't watch CNN. I don't know. But anyway, it was. It was on there. Yeah, it was a broadcaster. A news broadcaster said that. Well, Jesus Christ wasn't perfect. Really? He's the sinless Son of God. That's out and out heresy. That's out and out blasphemy for them to say something like that. But here again, and we're reading, we're seeing what's going on. The lies, the deception, all of that. And, they, you know, here in the Psalms we see it. How long is you, are you going to do this? Don't you know that you're blaspheming against the God of the universe? Don't you know you're blaspheming against the creator of all that is? Verse 5, my soul... My soul waiteth only upon God. For my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense, and I will and I shall not be moved. And God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Is in God. It's in God. That's it. Verse 8, trust in Him at all times. You people, pour out your hearts before Him. God is a refuge for us. Pour out yourself before Him. Now, I'm saying all of this because we need to go back and we think about what are we waiting on? What are we waiting on? We wait on the Lord. Yes, we pray for this nation. Yes, we pray for our president. Yes, we pray for all these things. But our faith, our hope, our trust is in God. In God alone. Thank God for President Trump, but he's not my Savior. Amen? Thank God he's done a, a lot of great things for this country. And he's defending Christians and Christian rights all over the world. Thank you, Jesus, for him. But he's not my Savior. He's not. And everybody's running around, what if, what if Joe Biden gets in? Well, I guess that it'll mean God will fall off his throne in heaven. Well, people look at it that way. No. It doesn't matter. God's still on the throne. Jesus Christ is still my Lord. And the Holy Spirit is still my companion. And I wait on Him. Not on the answers. Not on the phone call. I just wait on Him. I walk with Him. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen? Just helping everybody. I mean, we live in some pretty dark times. I'm not going to stick my head in the sand and say we don't. We do. We live in some pretty dark times, and there's some pretty foolish things that are going on. People are calling good evil and evil good. We can see it right now, the foolishness that's going on. So what do we do? What do we do during this time? We seek the Lord with all of our heart. We wait upon God. That's where our joy comes from. Amen? You look at this world, you're not going to get any joy from this world. You will not. Jesus said, I am your peace. I'm your peace. Not this world, not anything that they're doing, not the craziness of it, but I'm your peace. Come to me. Come to me. Come to me, all ye that are heavy laden. I'm heavy laden about this world. I really am. I'm about sick of this place. Well, the ungodliness, the people blaspheming Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm just done with this. This is not my home. This is not where I belong. It's not where you belong. Amen. Jesus said, I'm going away and I'm going to prepare you a place in my Father's house. I'm going to prepare you a place next to my Father's heart. That's what I'm going to do for you. That's where you belong because you're spiritual people and you're born from above, not born from beneath. You have a place in heaven. 
You have a place in my Father. You have a place in me. You have a place in the Holy Spirit. No wonder things look crazy to us. It doesn't make any sense to us. Why? Because we're spiritual people. We're not of this world. They're calling good evil and evil good. They're calling white black and black white, and we're just looking at them like, you people have no sense. You people have absolutely lost your mind. And they have. Amen. They have. Well, I could go on that rant, but I won't. Okay. Lamentations. But it is true, amen. amen. It is. Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3. And we'll just pick up here in verse 21. Lamentation 3.21, this I recall to my mind. So your memory, the things that you remember, the things that God puts on your heart. Remember those things, okay? Remember what Paul said? Forgetting those things which are behind. My past failures. My past altogether. Remember Paul's past? He was a murderer, wasn't he? He killed Christians. He reaped what he sowed. Did you ever think about that? What did he do? Paul killed Christians for their faith. Paul was killed for his faith in Christ. Paul imprisoned Christians. Paul was imprisoned for Christ. Isn't that interesting? Paul hated the people that were Christians, flipped the coin over. He loved the people of Christ and prayed for them daily. How it all flipped. That's interesting when you think about that. That's a study all in itself. All right. This I recall to mind, therefore have I hope. I have hope, what? In the things that the Holy Spirit brings back to my remembrance because he said he would. Amen. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord, the Lord, let this sink down in your heart. Heaven will be great. It'll be wonderful. Won't it be wonderful there? When with the Savior we enter the glory land, won't it be wonderful there? Yes, absolutely it will be. But you know what makes heaven heaven? The Lord. Amen. Wanting to spend time with Him. Wanting to fellowship with Him. Being with Him. That's what makes heaven heaven. The Lord, the Lord is my portion. The Lord's my portion. I don't care about any other things. The Lord's my portion. He is mine, and I am His. That's what it's all about, not what He can do for me. This goes all the way back, those that wait upon the Lord. He's my portion. I wait upon Him. Yes, I wait patiently on Him, He'll bring it to pass. Instead of worrying about and wanting to hurry up the phone call, let's go back to that. I wait patiently on him. He'll bring it to pass in his time. How many people know that the Lord's timing is perfect? Amen. How many people know that our timing is not perfect? <laughs> Nobody said amen. <laughs> Thank you, Al. Our timing, we think that it ought to be a microwave miracle minute. Because <laughs> you can microwave anything and it's done in a minute, right? Amen. amen. We can take, man, you can have coffee in 
you know, used to, used to take a little while to brew, brew coffee. My mom and dad had one of those percolators. You set it on the stove, you put the coffee in the top, put the water in the bottom, and it perked up through, and then when it poured out like tar, it was done. <laughs> that pretty strong coffee. Then you had to add water to it. That's why mom always drank cream with her coffee because, man, stuff come out like tar. Now we have Keurigs. You just put the little cup thingy in there and you pull down on the handle and you got a cup of coffee in five seconds. Yeah, yeah we've been conditioned, believe it or not. That it's, it's just a miracle minute, right? We just got to have it right now. But how many people know, I mean, being, you know, setting that aside, the Lord's timing is perfect. It fits in with His whole plan, His whole will. And we have to be careful not to get things out of sequence and not to get our will and get to pushing and saying, this is the way that I think God ought to do it. You're not God, and neither am I. So we wait on Him. We wait on His timing. We wait on Him. He knows what He's doing. And that's a step of faith. It takes faith to please God, right? And so we just, Lord, you're going to take care of this. How you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, that's not my part. My part is just to know that, Lord, you're going to take care of this. That's my part. Simple childlike faith. Right? That's what the Lord looks for. Just simple childlike faith. I don't have to know how you're going to do it. I don't have to know when you're going to do it. I don't know how if you have to move galaxies and all of that. You'll take care of that. My part, Lord, I just believe you. You'll take care of me. Why? Because you love me. That's why. Not based on my performance, but Lord, you love me. And you promised in your word. And you're a person, you're a man, you're a God of your promise. And you'll take care of it. All right? The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. Not the answer, I'll hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that, what? Wait for him. The timing thing, right? To the soul that what? Seeks who? Him. Seeks Him. Not what He can do for you, but seek Him. It's good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. That's a good thing. Why? Sometimes we have to ask these questions. Why? Well, that goes back into what, what Peter says, that, you know, faith worketh by love. And then it also there's patience and experience and hope. These build Christian character. Everybody knows that scripture, right, what I'm talking about? There's patience and experience and hope. Those things. But where's our hope? Not in our faith, right? This goes back to where's your focus? What are you believing in? Well, I've got faith in my faith. Well, that's a chink in your armor because the devil can come along and say, Oh, look, look what you did today. Look what you said. You said a word of unbelief today. And then he'll bring a million scriptures. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those that love it, wheat thereof. And if whatsoever a man sows with his mouth, he's going to eat that. You know, you said this, and now, oh, it's just going to be bad. Instead of, you know, my hope's in the Lord. He directs my path. He puts his words in my mouth. And if I do say something that's contrary to the word of God, you know what I do? repent because <laughs> the Holy Spirit will rise up on the inside and say, oh, don't say that. Here, I'll give you an example. People would think, you know, some people think that this is crazy, but it meant something to me because I used to walk around and say, man, Lord, I don't know. That's what I would say. 
Something would happen and I'd say, man, Lord, I don't know. Just like the Lord was standing right there. Something would happen. I said, man, Lord, I don't know. And then he looked at me and he said, don't say that. That's unbelief. Now, to some of you, it might be something small. But then he gave me the scripture. He says, I know all things. He said, didn't I say that about you? That you know all things? That you have the mind of Christ? That the memory of the righteous is blessed? And I mean, he just started, I was like, okay, I won't say that anymore. So I don't say that anymore. Amen. Amen. You see, that was a, but you see, to somebody, that was just like, boy, that seems like a small thing. But it was big with the Lord with me. So what did I do? I repented. I said, man, I'm not going to let that come out my mouth anymore. Praise God. I always love when I air my dirty laundry so everybody can learn from it. All right, praise God. Let's go over here, last verse, Psalm 27. Or no, let's go to Psalm 25. We'll probably jump both places. Psalm 25. Psalm 25, verse 3. Oh, we got a verse 1. I'm sorry. It's so good, though. Psalm 25, verse 1, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. All that I am, Lord, I lift it up to you. That should be our heart cry. All that I am. All that I am, O Lord, I lift it up to you. I give it to you. I sacrifice it on the altar of praise. I sacrifice it on the altar of holiness. That times in with uh, Romans chapter 12, right? Present your body as a living sacrifice. Present everything to God. It's all yours. I give it all to you. Everything that I am. Oh my God, I trust in Thee. I trust you, God. I trust you enough to give you my life. I trust you enough to give you every area of my life. I commit everything that I am Every area of my life, every part of my life, whatever my life touches, I commit it to you because I know that on that day, those things which I commit to you, you will keep those things until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We already talked about that a couple weekends ago, right? Committing things to the Lord, He'll keep them. He'll be the one that keeps them. Those that try to keep themselves will lose. You'll lose your life. Those that try to keep their life will lose it. And those that lose their life for my sake will find it, even to life everlasting. You know what Jesus said? Yeah. All right. Oh, my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Don't let the devil triumph over me. He won't. He doesn't have any power. Yea, let none that wait upon thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without a cause. Verse 4, show me thy ways. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me your path. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. For thou art the God of my salvation and on thee. Not the answer, not the phone call. On thee do I wait all the day long. I'm not going to waste my time sitting by a phone waiting on an answer. I'm going to waste, and it's not a waste, but I'm going to spend my time waiting on the Lord all the day long. Amen. Amen. Everybody get something today. Does that change and answer some questions and, and change things? But it changed, when I seen this, it changed me. It really did. Well, Father, we do love you. We love you for your word. We love you for revelation knowledge and for showing us things, Lord, that we can take and that we can apply to our lives. Father, I pray for all those here 
that this burn down deep on the inside of them, Father, that it be such a part of them. Father, I pray for those that are watching us all over the world, that it just burn so inside them, Father. We wait upon God, not the answer, but the God who gives the answer. And Lord, we just thank you and we bless you for this word. Thank you for correcting us. Thank you for showing us things. And Lord, we just, we love you, we thank you, and we bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise you, Lord. Well, if there's anyone here and you need prayer for anything, you want us to agree with you, you pray with you, we will do that. If you need healing in your body, if you need anything, you come down here, we'll pray with you.